Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And welcome to the Sturgis Public Library and our presentation today talking about Fort Meade and the changes of Fort Meade and the, how those changes affected Sturgis. Uh, I want to thank the South Dakota Humanities Council and the Sturgis Area Arts Council for the wonderful displays that are from the Smithsonian Institution. If you haven't had a chance to visit them yet, there's three of them on the first floor here and two more that are upstairs. Take some time to take a look at those. Uh, you might not have time today because the library closes at four, but those exhibits will be here through the end of the month. So come back and take a look at them. Uh, we do have uh, many more events coming up. There are some postcards like this that are back there on the counter back there. If, if you want to know more about Fort Meade, uh, the museum will be opening the middle of May. And we also will be having our annual meeting, Fort Meade membership meeting, but anybody's welcome to come. And that's on April 23rd, a Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock. It'll be at the Senior Citizen Center. And we're going to have a couple of the archaeologists that were doing the Soap Suds Row uh, thing coming and doing a presentation for us at that time. So if you want to come to that. And for those of you that don't know me, I'm Lee Strohshine. I am the research librarian and archivist here at the Sturgis Public Library. I'm also on the board of directors for the Fort Meade Museum. And in addition to myself presenting, we've got Randy Bender and Mark Rambo, and they're both also on the board of directors for the Fort Meade Museum. And I'll let them, if they want to tell more about themselves when they get up here, I'll let them talk about it. Uh, the portion that I'm going to talk about, as you can see, is Fort Meade through the years, 1878 to 1944, talking about the time of the military when they were there. The first suggestion of a military post in the Black Hills was made by Lieutenant Governor, Governor K. Warren in 1857. Warren had done the first detailed explorations in the area that became the Dakotas and the surrounding areas in 1855, 1856, and 1857. He presented his findings and publications to Congress, including a map of the region. And that is a copy of the map that he put out in 1857, of the Dakotas. Well, what? Nebraska and Dakota is what it was called. So. However, they did not follow up on his suggestion. They just let it slide. In 1873, General Philip Sheridan, the commander of the Division of the Missouri, which included the Black Hills, acknowledged that a post was needed in the Black Hills. The 1876 gold rush brought miners and other settlers into the Black Hills. This also brought raids by Native Americans and white outlaws. The settlers requested military presence to combat those raids. In June of 1878, Congress appropriated money for the construction of a post in the Black Hills. General Sheridan's aide and brother, Brevet Lieutenant Colonel Michael Sheridan, was sent to find a location to build the fort. He recommended Rapid City as the location, possibly because of financial involvement in Rapid City. <laughs> In July of 1878, the 7th Cavalry set up a camp on Spring Creek on the northwest side of Bear Butte and named it Camp J.G. Sturgis after Lieutenant James Sturgis, <coughs> who had been killed at Little Bighorn with Custer. After the camp was set up, a makeshift, makeshift town sprang up on the homestead claim of the grasshopper Jim <coughs> Frederick near the camp and became known as Scoop Town. Also in July of that year, General Sheridan visited the area and determined that the location where Fort Meade is now at would be the best location for a post. So in August of 1878, a construction camp was established along Bear Butte Creek that would be known as Camp Rulin, named for Lieutenant George Rulin, who was assigned with overseeing the construction of the post. Now, image here. 
It's identified as Camp Ruin, 1878. However, by looking at the location of it, it couldn't have been Camp Ruin, because Camp Ruin was where Fort Meade is now. So this is possibly Camp J.G. Sturgis, or as Mark and I were discussing before this, there was an infantry camp that was established in the same area that was known as Bear Butte Camp. This might be Bear Butte Camp because that, that camp was for the infantry. Camp J.G. Sturgis was for the cavalry. Well, there's no horses in this picture, no place for it. So we were just talking about that before and something that needs a little more research as to what was going on. With the location of the post established, new towns were announced in the area. There was Ruin City at the mouth of Boulder Canyon, about seven miles from the construction camp. Dudley Town was reported about a mile and a half closer. Sturgis City was located one mile from the post. It was named after Colonel Samuel Sturgis, who was one of the early investors in the town. Sturgis City was laid out by Jeremiah C. Wilcox, a cousin of Colonel Sturgis's wife. Ruland City and Dudley Town quickly faded away. In November of 1878, the first building, the guardhouse, was completed. And here we have a ground plan of Fort Meade from 1879, a map showing different things. And this is on the map, it's not what's here, I kind of cut it down. So this, this is what is, is written on the map. Post of Fort Meade DT was established in September 1878. Reservation declared by the president under the date of December 18, 1878 with boundaries as shown in the above plat. And it's General Order 27, Department of Dakota, December 31, 1878. Located four miles southwest from Bear Butte at the entry of the Black Hills on Bear Butte Creek, about 200 miles south-southwest from Bismarck, Dakota Territory. Post office and telegraph station at the post nearest railroad station, Bismarck, Dakota Territory. Quartermaster supplies and subsistence stores furnished by wagon trains from Bismarck, Dakota Territory. Wood abundant, supplied by contract, also, hay, water, good, no Indians located near the post, July 13th, 1879. And so in here, you can see across the bottom here, those are the officer's quarters. And if you're familiar with Fort Meade's layout today, the location of those officer's quarters haven't changed a whole lot. Barracks are up here. Here's the commissary warehouse. It's the big, long, white building. Still out there, still in existence from this one here. Hospital, which will pop up frequently. Hospitals there, trader's store there, and the stables are up there. By the end of 1878, storehouses, barracks, and some officers' quarters were completed. And here you can see, this is from 1889, but it shows the officers' quarters as well. The officer's quarters, some of those buildings were single houses, and some of them were duplexes. And the thing is, the duplexes were closer to the commanding officer's quarters, and the single, uh, single houses were farther away. And the way it worked in the military at that time, it might still work this way, I don't know. If you were more senior, in rank or in time and grade, and you were assigned to a post, you could kick out whoever was lesser than you. So let's say you were a new captain assigned to Fort Meade, and you had taught, you had been a captain longer than anyone else at the post. You could kick out the most senior captain that was there out of his house. And then he'd kick the one out of the next house that he wanted to move into, and it just bounced all the way down the line. There is no record of it here at Fort Meade, but in some posts, if you were the lowest ranking lieutenant, you and your family ended up living in a tent because there was no house for you. You'd get bounced down the way. And the duplexes were nicer buildings than the individual houses. And so this more senior officer, plus they were closer to the commanding officer, so 
Rank has its privileges. In December, December, the post was named for Meade in honor of General George Meade of Civil War fame. He had died in 1872, and a lot of posts they named after famous generals or other well-known military figures. By July of 1879, construction was completed at Fort Meade with 15 officers' buildings south of the parade grounds and five sets of barracks on the north side for enlisted men. Other buildings <coughs> were NCO and band quarters, the adjutant's office, hospital, sawmill, bakehouse, guardhouse, granary, trader's store, storehouses, stables, and shops. Fort Meade became the regimental headquarters for the 7th Cavalry. And we have a photo from 1888. You can see the officer's quarters. Officer's quarters here. These ones here are some of the duplexes. And these are some of the single ones. And they all had fences with yards, gardens there that they could do. We have the barracks here, stables behind. Move around over to this side. We have the guardhouse and the headquarters. And that's roughly where the headquarters in the museum are today. And then other barracks and the stables. You can see over on this side. Here we have Soap Suds Row in that area there. The 1880 census listed 525 persons at Fort Meade. A lot of people out there, especially when you compare it to the amount that lived in Sturgis City according to that census. 60. <laughs> and 47 living outside the city limits. So, five times as many at Fort Meade as there was in Sturgis in 1880, according to the census. August of 1880 brought the arrival of the 25th Infantry, consisting of four companies. The 25th Infantry was one of the four regiments of African American soldiers in the Army, the ones known as Buffalo Soldiers. And here's a photograph of one company of the 25th Infantry at Fort Meade. You'll notice the officers standing in the back behind them are white. The rest of the troops are all African American. And that's the way they, they did it. By the end of 1881, the government had appropriated more money for the fort. The post facilities consisted of 23 sets of officers' quarters, 10 barracks for the enlisted personnel, a headquarters building, eight stables, one bakery, two quartermaster storehouses, one commissary, one band quarters, the hospital, four buildings for NCOs, two shops for mechanics, the sawmill, an ammunition magazine, the guardhouse, and a building that doubled as a school for children of post personnel and as a church. So it was a city all to itself, everything that it needed. 1883 newspaper reports of the injuries sustained by soldiers, quote, in the drunken brawls in Sturgis City <laughs> that were treated by the post surgeon. In 1885, after an incident following the death of Ross Hallett, the townspeople of Sturgis requested that the Army remove the 25th Infantry. The Army refused. We got a couple of seats up here in the front if you... All right, thank you. The summer of 1888 saw the departure of the 7th Cavalry and the 25th Infantry. The 25th Infantry was transferred due to the needs of the Army, not the wants and complaints of the city of Sturgis. And they, also in that year, the 8th Cavalry arrived. In 1889, First Lieutenant Gilmore of the 8th Cavalry, the post quartermaster, compiled a comprehensive report on the buildings that had been constructed on the fort since its establishment, so in 10 years. The report listed 73 structures and described each in detail. The report stated that the government had spent a grand total of 
$82.59 on the buildings and facility for the fort during the first 11 years. And here we have a map from 1892 showing the layout of the fort at that time. Not a lot of changes from the earlier map, just more and more buildings. Again, we have the hospital here, the storehouse that still exists, the officer's quarters here, <coughs> barracks there, stables there. Over here, we have the canteen and the library as well. And then the band quarters. I found that interesting, that the band had their own place, their own quarters. They didn't have to stay with the other enlisted men. <laughs> and a photograph here, guard mount of Fort Meade, 1891. You can see again the barracks and some of the buildings in the background. Wooden barracks at that time. View looking from the opposite side of where we were, officers' quarters here. <coughs> okay, post hospital there, commissary building there. And if you notice, it does look familiar with the one that's still out there. And there they are on parade. We have cavalry, which would have been the eighth cavalry at this time. <coughs> In February of 1895, the post hospital was destroyed by fire. 1899, the Army made the decision to designate Fort Meade as a permanent post. 1900 to 1911, more than $1 million was spent on improvements at the post. Most went to replacing the wooden quarters and stables with stone and brick structures and to improving the road and water systems. One of the contractors to be involved with the new construction was William Grahams, who erected the 100-foot high iron flagpole on the east end of the parade grounds in 1901. He also built some of the new sandstone, sandstone quarters and the new guardhouse. And here we've got a picture from Roughly 1904, showing some of the new sandstone buildings, the new guardhouse, which is now the post office. Uh, however, the headquarters building, the new headquarters building, isn't in this picture because it's still the old one right there. But the barracks, officers' quarters are still in existence there. Now we have a map from 1904. Layout is still pretty much the same. Things are pretty much where they were in the last one that we saw. Hospital there, storehouse, the officers' quarter, barracks, and the stables. Okay, and a comparison of the two from 1892 to 1904 doesn't show much difference. A few more buildings, but not a lot of difference. Big change comes between 1904 and 1905 maps. Here's the 1905 map. You notice the big indent in the officers' quarters, and notice the stables. They are now positioned differently than they were before. And a comparison of those two to see the differences in those. The spring of 1911, most troops at Fort Meade were sent to Texas and New Mexico due to the Mexican Revolution. Again in 1914, troops were sent to New Mexico, leaving Fort Meade two officers and 14 enlisted men. The post remained with few troops during World War I and the years following. But showing the same time, 1912, you can see now the new Headquarters building, <coughs> right here. Real easy to pick out because of the cupola on the top of it. Mm -hmm. This barracks building no longer exists. 
and this barracks building no longer exists. And then another view of it with this one. Now, if this picture kind of looks familiar, this is a little shameless self-plug on my part. This is the, book, the picture that's on the cover of the book that Bobby Sago and I did on Fort Meade. And I do have a few copies of it if anybody's interested. <laughs> And then another picture showing some of the stables that no longer exist because of the building of the VA hospital. 1921, a resolution was introduced to transfer Fort Meade to the Public Health Service for use as a soldier's hospital. There was much discussion through the early 1920s regarding converting Fort Meade into the soldier's hospital. And here we have, here's the hospital, and you can see the other barracks, you can see the flagpole in there as well. And another view, a front view of the hospital, it doesn't exist anymore out there. 1924 brought the 4th Cavalry back to man the post. The idea of a veterans hospital was shelved for the time. The residents of Sturgis were pleased with the military remaining. And as you can see in this picture, which is a picture of Barry Stadium, which had a lot of activity during the 4th Cavalry years in the 20s and 30s, you can see by the number of cars that are around there, there were lots of people that came to the different events out there at the time. In 1933, Fort Meade became the headquarters of the Civilian Conservation Corps program in South Dakota. In 1934, facilities were built on the west edge of the military reservation and became known as Camp Fechner. Ten barracks buildings, mess halls, bathhouses, and shops were constructed. The camp's capacity was 200 men. And you can see this is Camp Fechner. It doesn't exist anymore. There's a few foundations and some chimneys, but it's gone. During the late 1930s, horses were starting to be replaced by machines. 1942 brought an end to the horses. Cavalry was all mechanized by that time. World War II brought heightened security to the post with a fence erected, erected around the perimeter and public access was limited. 1943, 4th Cavalry departed for war duty. The last troops left in December of 1944. And in April of 19, December of 43, in April of 1944, Fort Meade was transferred from the military to the Veterans Administration. November of 1944, a POW camp was established at Fort Meade with 100 prisoners brought from Fort Robinson, and they were housed in Camp Fechner. The prisoners were used as labor to convert Fort Meade to a VA facility. And the final slide I have is showing the different units that were stationed at Fort Meade and the years that they were there. That is the end of my portion. I'll turn it over to Randy here. Where was the that camp? Like a, Camp Fechner, where was, like if I, for me now, like how okay. it exists, like if, where is it at? Okay, if, if you head up the road to the cemetery, okay. you know where the cemetery yep. is, just as you're going up that road off to the left hand side, there's that little draw in there, and you can see there's some chimneys in there, and a few remains, that's where Camp Fechner was. Oh, so it's a natural hole area. Okay. Um, the chimney that's up on the hillside is what remains of the commander's Headquarters, the officers' quarters from um, Camp Tefner. Okay. There are a couple other foundations there. I think if you take the Centennial Trail too from Fort Meade, you go right. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. the, the so parking lot from the Centennial right. Trail. Yeah, trail. Very far. I mean, I feel like I've been everywhere out there, but that's one thing that I did not know about. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what was stage with? 1889. 1889. Pop quiz. <laughs> Can anybody tell me where that quote comes from? That sentence. To care for him who shall have borne the battle. Yes. No. no. Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln. It is Abraham Lincoln. Second inaugural address. Yeah, it's the final sentence of his second inaugural address. 
the full quote goes like this. I think we had a question back here. <laughs> yeah, I didn't hear anybody say anything about that rodeo grounds back there. What the story gets for you that? Barry Stadium? Yeah. Yeah, it was. Um, what was that? What was that all about? Uh, well, Barry Stadium was a riding arena, training grounds for the fort. Uh, it was the host grounds for the Fort Meade Horse Show, which, according to some reports, brought in as many as 4,000 people Ooh, wow. to see that over the years. Uh, but, uh, it was named for Colonel Barry. Uh, Colonel Barry had been an Olympian. They, he had trained the Olympic horse team, the equestrian team. Um, and he had commanded out at Fort Meade for a very short time. Did they play a polo there, or where did they play? The polo, as I understand it, was done on the parade ground. Uh, so. so, anyway, Lincoln's quote is this. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in to bind up the nation's wounds. To care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan. To do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. It was delivered on March 4th, 1865. And this particular line has also become the motto for the Department of Veterans Affairs. Mm -hmm. So, what well, we all know Fort Meade is a VA hospital. Now, officially called the VA Black Hills Healthcare System, Fort Meade Campus, because one use one word when you can use a dozen. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but how did it transition? How did it go from becoming a cavalry post, one of the last active cavalry posts in our region, to what it is today, a state-of-the-art medical facility. Well, that's what we're going to be looking at here for the next few minutes in my presentation. By 1942, Fort Meade had reached its maximum size. That was 8,357 acres. It considered a watershed, timber reserves, stone quarries, firing ranges, um, hay fields, uh, grounds where they could practice horse maneuvers. It was a big area. But the future of the fort was soon to be in question. As you heard, by the end of 1943, all the troops had left the post, leaving only a nucleus of the quartermaster and the medical department. And through the efforts of the Sturgis Chamber of Commerce and our congressional delegation, very similar to what happens every few years when there's a base alignment talk and Ellsworth is on the chopping block, everyone goes to town to save it. That's what Sturgis did. But due to their work, the War Department looked seriously at converting the old post into a 750-bed neuropsychiatric hospital. That transfer was recommended in March of 44, and it became official on 15 April 1944. And those 8,357 acres were transferred to the Veterans Administration. Well, immediately work began on converting the buildings to hospital use. This list um, comes from a book called The Fort Meade Centennial, 1878 to 1978. And it shows uh, a number of the buildings, when they were built, what they were originally used for, what they are used for now. And while many of those buildings were easily switched over, I mean the housing just became housing. Um, from May 44 to early 45, they still had to do a lot of work. They had to add a lot of necessary grill work. They had to do a complete locking system over the entire hospital. They installed overhead sprinklers, exterior fire exits, kitchens, dining rooms. And my personal favorite <laughs> is my generation. We simply called them the corridors. 
The corridors was a system of covered walkways that connected the entire hospital. Um, you can see it running along the, but these are all the, the old barracks buildings, which now became the hospital. It ran along the back of all of those. Uh, you can see it here coming out. Here's one of the archways where it went over a road, connecting it to that stable building. It continued on up here where it connected to the gymnasium, the rec hall, the movie theater, and the chapel. Once you got into the hospital, you could get anywhere you needed to be without having to go outside. And as a 12-year-old boy, these were near magical facilities. Because <laughs> um, yes. um, when I, we moved here in 67, this was no longer in use. In 67, they had moved totally into the new hospital. Um, those were our private playground, unless you got too rambunctious and somebody called the Fort Meade guards on you. But yeah, we tried not to make that happen. Um, but some of the other buildings then that had to be converted was what had been the headquarters building for the fort, now became the administration building for the VA. The top floor had been the ballroom for the fort, that now became a trainer, training and lecture hall. The post hospital became the general medical facility and surgical suite for the for the VA, all the barracks buildings were converted into neuropsychiatric wards. Now, in this picture, um, you can see the back side of the hospital. This part had originally been the dental facility. Um, as it became a VA hospital, that portion of it was turned into housing for the general female staff, the non-medical female personnel, and it became known as the Hen House. <laughs> um, it also earned a reputation as the place to go for the best parties on um, the grounds, um, but they were also well chaperoned by the older female staff that lived there, according to the reports I have. Um, as you read, this building then was torn down in the early 60s, so it no longer exists. Now this building is still there. Um, it was the old officers club and bachelor officers quarters. And this building became uh, housing for nursing staff and medical students. The old theater remained a theater. Movies three nights a week and a place for concerts for the patients. The old rec center maintained its previous job. It was a rec center for the hospital, a place for hosting parties and dinners for the patients and for the staff and their families. Um, when we were there, the annual Christmas and Halloween parties, hay rides, all ended up there. It was a wonderful facility. You've heard talk about the commissary building, that white wooden structure. Uh, again, it's the oldest building on the post, built in 1879 as a warehouse for the commissary. It's now a warehouse, became a warehouse for the engineering department. Right in front of it was a root cellar. Uh, and then as we moved into the Cold War era, it became a fallout shelter. The chapel for the post was originally this white building um, across the street from where the current fire department is. That building burned down <coughs> sometime in the late 40s, and the chapel moved to this structure, which is still there. Now that building had been many different things over the years. Uh, it had been an officer's club, it had been a tailor shop, it had been a PX, it had been a gymnasium, workout room, and kind of probably from that last use, the exercise rec thing, uh, on the back side of it, sticking out, is a four-lane bowling alley, um, which was still maintained for the use of the patients. Um, and it was still in operation when Kathy and I lived there. Um, the pins are set manually. Um, 
Jan, I think your brother used to work there as a pin setter. Uh, and <laughs> but other friends of mine that did work there said that um, it was manual pin setting. They said the patients weren't too careful about making sure you were out of the way before they threw the ball. So yeah, be a little careful there. We also used it for the Sturgis Archery Club for a couple of years. Okay. And what, what time period was that? 76, 8. Okay. Um, 1976. <laughs> <laughs> the old writing hall. Uh, previously to the switch over to the VA, it had already been come, become a gymnasium, and it stayed a gymnasium. Uh, during its Fort Meade years as well. Uh, still a gymnasium now, used by the National Guard. That's where St. Martin's played their basketball games. Okay. Was it a dirt floor when it was the riding hall? Yes. Okay. Okay. And then these are the buildings that required some of the biggest changes, the old barracks. This is what became the actual neuropsychiatric hospital wards. Um, so again, putting in the metal grating, make sure they had the fire suppression systems. Uh, they had to change all the locks so that you had a master locking system for everything. A lot of work went on there. The old stables, one of the stables became the kitchen and dining room for the whole hospital, which is why there was that, that one walkway, that one part of the bicycle path, that went all the way down there so that people could go there to eat or food could be transported to the wards. Um, and this is a comment that I found in the book when I was researching this. It says, think it's rough getting to work now, getting breakfast ready for patient care? Well, back then, the only ventilation was a series of windows high up near the roof. Yeah, you can see the windows. The only way to open them was with a hook on the end of a long pole. <laughs> or how about arriving in the dining room to find ice lining the inside walls, icicles hanging from the rafters, and sweeping snow off the tables before you start prep for breakfast. Yeah, it's a little, little more work right there. So. Uh, across the highway from Fort Meade, uh, that had been the hay field for the fort, mm -hmm. it became the hospital farm. Um, they grew vegetables, they raised cattle, pigs, chickens, and eggs. All of that was used for the dietetic service of the hospital. Um, and in addition to help supply the food for the kitchen, um, the gardening and the animal husbandry was used as training and rehabilitation for the men. Um, and in addition, I found this interesting, for a short time the farm even worked in conjunction with South Dakota Game Fish and Parks to raise pheasants that were released into the wild to try and build a population here in West River. So if you happen to come across a Chinese ring-necked pheasant in West River, it may have a Fort Meade connection somewhere. Now, as you can see, those buildings cover quite an area, which is why they had to come up with Dodd's bicycle path. It connected all the neuropsych wards, the admin building, the kitchen, the dining room, the gym, theater, chapel, and rec hall. Once inside the hospital complex, you could go where you needed to be without having to go outside. And that came in especially helpful during the blizzard of 1949. Kermit Stell shared this account. Uh, Kermit was um, head of finance at the time. His wife was the head dietitian, and they lived in quarters one, which is right next to um, the nurses' house and the old officers' quarters there. This is his report. The storm raged for 48 hours. All roads were closed. No traffic of any kind to or from Sturgis. But the shift played on. Nurses became aides. Dietitians became mess attendants. How well I remember arising at 4 a.m., our car bearing no lights visible. 
My wife and I hurriedly dressed and crawled out a window as both doors were completely blocked. We bucked the wind, holding on to each other to keep from blowing away. Bucking drifts that were taller than we were, thankful to find even two or three feet of clear ground. In order, we finally reached the first building that connected to the bicycle path. Now that would have been the chapel from where they were. From their housing, they reached the chapel, and from there they made it to the kitchen and started making coffee and sandwiches for the 400 patients and a full shift of employees. And then, this is the government we're talking about now, <laughs> questions arose about did the staff have to pay for this meal? <laughs> to which the manager responded, to hell with charges, just feed them. <laughs> uh, most of the employees commented that it was the first free thing they had ever gotten. <laughs> so you've heard me talk about uh, Dodd quite a bit. His first name was Grover, Grover Dodd, and he was the resident engineer for the fort. He was in charge of all the construction. He was also the man in charge of hiring and firing. And due to the amount of work required to get all of this done in a pretty short time frame, anything and anybody that could wield a hammer or a saw was hired. But Dodd did not put up with inferior work or being a slacker on the job. If it was unsatisfactory, Dodd's response was simply, fire him, and there was no appeal. And so, in order to get the work completed, German POWs were brought in to do the job. A total of 600 men came. 400 of them worked in the surrounding sugar beet fields, and those are the men that were housed at Camp Fechner that Lee talked about. Uh, the other 200 people were housed in a converted army barracks, um, which at the time was across the road from the old hospital, kind of next to uh, the engineering, the brick engineering building loading dock area. Uh, if this building looks familiar, it's because when they finished using it, it was sold, and it's now the Owens Interstate Carquest building. So it's one of our Sturgis connections, right there. Um, now, using POWs was not without controversy. Uh, in fact, there was quite a scandal about it, that Sturgis men, locals, were being fired in order to get the POW help, which was supposed to be cheaper. Yeah. Now, that itself is not true. If you were using POW labor, the contractor had to pay the government the same thing he would have paid a civilian. And then that money was used for the care and the housing of the PW, um, as well as covering construction expenses. But eventually, there was a big investigation. Uh, Dodd was found to be innocent of all the charges. It was just the men could not do the required work, particularly the stone masonry work. A number of the German prisoners were highly skilled in that area. And so that's where they were being used. Um, it was an agreement was made that as free labor became available that was able to do the work required, it would replace the PW labor. Well, in less than a year from the land transfer, the old fort was ready for its new mission. On April 6, 1945, opening ceremonies were held. The Star Spangled Banner was played, Old Glory was run to the top of the flagpole, and a new chapter of Fort Meade history was rung in. Now, of course, all of, some of the new staff had some trouble adjusting to Fort Meade. One of them in particular was a uh, man who worked in the finance department who had just arrived from Mississippi. And when he didn't show up for work one September day, his supervisor called him, and the supervisor was told that the recent arrival could not understand how employees could brave the three inches of snow that had fallen the night before. <laughs> Reports are that he was told he would survive the walk across the parade ground. He made it safely to work and never missed another day of work. 
Some of the other uh, transitions, things that happened early on, um, things that lasted for a short time, some of them are still happening. Uh, for a short time, uh, the entrance to the hospital was guarded. To get in, you stopped at a guarded gate. You had to present identification, explain where you're going, what your purpose was. Initially, doctors wore uniforms, similar to a naval officer's uniform. Um, until it was seen that the patients reacted negatively to what they saw as military authority. And so that practice was dropped. Nurses and staff were required to stand when a doctor entered the room. And again, as people got used to each other, things got a little more relaxed. <coughs> and an effort was made to route air traffic away from the hospital. As the sound of airplanes caused many of the men to panic. Another big change that happened to the Fort Meade grounds came about in September of 1948. That's when the first four burials took place at what was then Fort Meade National Cemetery. It was officially dedicated in October, so a few days later. During its first year, 91 burials were done. But it didn't take long to realize that the name Fort Meade National Cemetery was an unfortunate choice. It got confused with the hospital. It was confused with the old military cemetery on the hillside. It was confused with Fort George G. Meade in Maryland. So in 1949, the name was officially changed to the Black Hills National Cemetery. Well, as the mission of Fort Meade grew, so did the old hospital itself. New construction was started in 1956, with the first building being completed in 1958. Other buildings followed in 1960, 1962, and the hospital pretty much as we know it now was completed in 1967 when all the patients were moved into the new facility. But in 1968, all those old buildings, well, they were declared surplus and demolition began. As Lee pointed out, two of the barracks buildings were demolished um, before the citizens of Sturgis and Fort Meade organized, they got they organized the Fort Meade Historic Society, they did the necessary paperwork, and in 1971, the buildings surrounding the parade ground were placed on the historic register, which is why we still have Fort Meade as we see it today. Now, during the transition, there was some concern. You know, was the hospital payroll ever going to match that of the military post? The, the, having that army post there was a big shot in the arm to the merchants and everybody of Sturgis. <clears throat> well, in 1948, the VA payroll was already somewhere in the neighborhood of a million dollars a year. And by 1976, that payroll had grown to $8,183,083. And it has continued to grow, and where Fort Meade is now our area's largest employer. Another fun little connection with Sturgis that I like is the Fort Meade Federal Credit Union. This was chartered in 1950 with eight members and $260 in assets. Their office was in the basement of the post office. Now over the years, it's changed names as its mission and scope has grown. It became Meade Plus, now it's the North Hills Federal Credit Union. Well, I called them on Thursday just to check up on things. And as of Thursday, they now have 10,429 members. And they have assets of $138,182,356.28. The Fortnite and Sturgis have connections that are going back nearly 130 years. Credit union is just one of them. As I mentioned, the POW barracks is another one. And as near as I 
can find out is I think we have at least three houses in town that are also houses from Fort Meade that have been moved in to Sturgis. And those 8,357 acres, well, Fort Meade only retains 250 of them. So all the rest, well, that's pretty much this 250 acres. Everything else is now part of the school system. South Dakota National Guard, Black Hills National Cemetery, or the BLM grounds, where it's used for agricultural and recreational use. Um, the Fort Meade at one point stretched from Bear Butte Lake to the National Cemetery in Dead Man's Canyon. It stretched from the Sturgis city limits to the Buffalo Chip. It was a big area. Now, is that just that little bit that's left? Well, that's what I have for you. So I'm going to turn it over to... Brandy, can I ask a question? Yeah. Isn't the VFW, wasn't that part of the Vector or or Me building, the Vets Club? Yes, that was the NCO Club. Uh, it was located next to the swimming pool. <coughs> I don't know if you remember where the swimming pool at Fort Meade used to be. Uh, again, yeah, so that would make four buildings. When the POWs were done, like, was that like a normal practice in the U.S. to like have POWs work on infrastructure projects? Like, were they all over the nation? Like, I mean, I know that's um, not to do with Fort Meade, but I... Largely. Um, here, I said they worked a lot with the agriculture. Uh, mainly because of the labor shortage, all the men were <clears throat> in the Pacific Theater or in Europe. Um, and, but to be honest, how common that was in other parts of the country, I don't know. I know it was in Iowa. Yeah. We have got you know, some postcards at the museum of POWs that rolled back after getting back to Germany, um, thanking people for their humane treatment and. Yeah, it'd be interesting to like, would they be glad that they came to Fort Meade uh, versus having to go work some, you know, like it'd just be to see like how Some of them said done. they liked it here because the Black Hills reminded them of parts of Germany. Um, it's one of, one of the reasons they trained here is because the mountains here are very similar to the mountains in Germany. So it was that. Um, the people that worked in the beet fields, we had a, uh, a large contingent of German people or people of German heritage here. So that when people would work on the farms, a lot of times um, the farmer or his wife could speak German, which was a big plus for a lot of these people. Um, Eleanor Miller has a wonderful story of working with the, some PWs on their beef farm. Wow. Community gardens are causing too. Yep, but I think it was always there, in the just build his house. Yeah, it was yeah. Fort Robinson had POWs also. Yeah. And there's another camp of them up by um, Belfouche, Mormon Dam. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, when, our, when they, the men left here, they went to Fort Robinson. And from there, they were repatriated their back to Did they all go at the same time? I mean, were they all released to go home? No. From here, it was just small groups. The last group to leave were some of the men from the Fort Meade conversion. The uh, agricultural workers left earlier. Just along those lines, I had a grand uncle who was with the 109th Engineers here, was taken a prisoner of war with a group of people from Sturgis area um, during the Kasserine Pass, and he was a Nazi POW mm -hmm. in Germany. And when he got out of his POW camp, he has, was very slender, starved almost, and he came back to rehab and they had him as a guard out at Fort Meade to help guard the German POWs because he had learned to speak the language and everything. And he always told me that the German POWs that were here, most of them were really glad they were here because the war had really turned on the Germans by then. And they knew that they probably would have been just sacrificed for, you know, those dying gasps of that regime. So they were not all of them, but a lot of them were kind of relieved. Yeah. Well, anyway, I'm going to speak on 
a little bit different topic. I'm going to look at things more from the Sturgis perspective and how its relationship with Fort Meade developed. My name is Mark Rambo. I'm the president of the Sturgis and Meade County Historical Society. We started up about seven, eight years ago. And uh, there's several different entities now that you know are collecting history in the area. Of course, Fort Meade Museum, and I'm on the board with these gentlemen. I think there's probably about five of the board members for the Historical Society here. And then recently, we also have another group that started up called the Bear, Be Bear Butte Creek Historic Preservation Council. And they are uh, managing the school lands between the BLM and the high school, which includes um, Soap Suds Row and the old rifle range area and just a lot of cultural and natural um, art artifact area out there. Um, and it's the Historic Preservation Council that hosted the archaeological dig this past summer and fall, and we're going to be doing so again this next year, and who knows, many years in the future, hopefully. So, um, and Ross Lampier is the president of that organization. So, if you have questions, he's your man. Um, anyway, I wanted to talk a little bit about things more from the, the Sturgis perspective and how it related to Fort Meade. Um, of course, before there were Sturgis and Fort Meade, um, the infantry came in in late June 1878 and established Camp Air View, uh, followed quickly by the 7th Cavalry, who arrived in early July, I think around July 1st. Um, and they established Camp J.G. Sturgis. There's something in my research I've been finding, I think there were two separate camps. Of course, it makes sense militarily, they wouldn't put it cavalry camp in with an infantry unit. So um, I have a, a newspaper article that talks about um, Camp J.G. Sturgis and then Grasshopper Jim's place and then a half a mile away from the other camp is Camp Bear View. So there could be two camps out there that we need to identify and find. Um, anyway, but they're located by Grasshopper Jim's place out there and uh, they slowly after the uh, area designated for Fort Meade, they slowly moved, but it took a while, it took months for the units, the military units, to do so. In the interim, a civilian camp was established out there at Grasshopper Jim's place. It was mostly uh, gaming interests from Deadwood, and uh, they had a tent city that would pop up whenever a payday would roll around. And uh, they had dance halls, gambling houses, they had vendors out there that would sell socks and gloves and things, and you name it, they had it out there. And it became known as Scoop Town. And I want to address the word, that term Scoop Town real quickly, because there's a real negative connotation to that. The, to scoop was a very common term in that, that era. Um, it was used a lot in sports. Um, if you beat another team, you scooped them, that kind of thing. It was really just meant that you got the edge on somebody or you won out, that kind of thing. Um, the only place we really find it today is in journalism, where you get the scoop on another journalistic entity when you get a story. Um, it isn't necessarily a negative thing, and there were a lot of ways that soldiers were scooped. Everything from, you know, dance hall girls, and prostitution, and, and alcohol, and those kind of things, all the way down to the other end of it, where, you know, people were literally buying, you know, extra socks, because they there's, had holes in them. And, and that sort of thing. So um, it isn't by itself a negative scoop. I know that there's a couple of local people who over the years have said that it means prostitution, and it doesn't. It is one aspect of scooping somebody, but it could be, you know, selling them, you know, notebooks or <laughs> pencils or whatever too. So, um, but anyway, uh, Scoop Town initially developed independently from Sturgis City when it started. Um, it, they, they existed separately for several months, and Sturgis um, was kind of a separate community growing on its own, and as the soldiers moved from uh, Camp Air Butte, Camp J.G. Sturgis, to uh, Camp Fechner, is that right? Fechner. Ruland, I knew Fechner wasn't right, I got, got the CCC up in my brain. Uh, Camp Ruland, um, Slowly, the Scoop Town interests moved in and kind of found themselves on Main Street in Sturgis. So. 
All right, so our town was laid out in August 1878. I believe it was August 16th, surveyed by Major J.C. Wilcox, as was earlier established. Um, and it was intended to directly service the community of Fort Meade. Uh, there's, there's a real natural uh, positioning for it here. It's not, um, it's not on the base, but boy, it's as close as you can get. And you have to go to Sturgis if you're going to go anywhere else in the hills. And uh, a lot of the investors, of course, were from Fort Meade. Uh, General Sturgis himself, Colonel Sturgis, was one of the largest investors. Um, he owned a lot of city lots, and over the years, he retained those. Even after he left as commander here, he retained his, a lot of the properties he had and collected rents off them. Um, well, as I said, the proximity to the fort was undisputed. I mean, again, you could not go from Fort Meade into the hills without passing through Sturgis. And that angered some people at Deadwood, because Deadwood saw themselves as the metropolis of the Black Hills. And they, they did not want Sturgis existing. They didn't want Fort Meade where it was initially. They wanted it out by Centennial Prairie, but uh, that got nixed really quickly. There's no uh, real good clean water out there. Everything was polluted by mining interests at that point. The main clean water in this part of the hills is Bearview Creek, because all the mining on it was in the upper part of Bearview Creek. Then it goes underground, and it gets filtered, and it gets washed before it pops up again here where the fort was. So it was a natural location for that to exist. But Deadwood did not like the fact that the community of Sturgis existed at all. And they made it very clear over the years. They tried many different ways of, of uh, undermining the community and uh, trying to uh, even get rid of the community. They tried at one point to um, talk General Sturgis into making Fort Meade a square rather than a long rectangle so that it would encompass the town site of Sturgis and uh, therefore it wouldn't be able to exist on military reservation. So. Has it changed much? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, another natural thing for the town of Sturgis being where it was, after the fort was established, it became the convergence point for all three major roads coming into the area. The Bismarck Trail, the Fort Peter Trail, and the Sydney Trail. Every major trail coming from the north, east, and south converged at the head of Main Street, right at Junction and Main. And that's how they would then go from there to Deadwood and the other mining camps coming in with any supplies they might have. So it's, it's a, it was a natural, natural uh, thing for the Sturgis to be developed where it was. Okay, and we talked, you mentioned this too, there was a lot of speculation on a new town being developed and there was Ruined City, which they said was the <coughs> mouth of uh, Boulder Canyon. And then right below that, there was going to be Dudley Town, but then eventually it came out. And those were both in September that that speculation was occurring. But the September 25th Deadwood paper uh, stated the new town was officially named Sturgis City. And by that time, uh, they also reported that on September 24th that there were 20 homes under construction and 54 under contract. Um, some of those were probably businesses too. Um, but it's a significant amount of construction going on in about a month's period of time between when the city was laid out and late September. October 3rd, the Cheyenne newspaper reported that there were 600 civilians and 200 teams of animals engaged at Camp Ruin, which, uh, of course, they would have needed to stay somewhere. They would have needed to go somewhere to get their, their, their uh, food and and supplies and all that. So Sturgis was quickly uh, established as that center of all that commerce that was coming in from Fort Meade and the whole surrounding area. October 5th, it said that there were five saloons, five stores, and three sawmills. Of course, the fort needed a lot of wood. So, and the, grow, the building of the city required a lot of wood. So there were three sawmills, and they said buildings are going up on every hand. So all all corners of town and the fort were busy with construction all fall. But it was still a distinct thing from Scoop Town. Scoop Town was still located out uh, by where the military camps were west, on the west side of Bearview. And, you know, it would have been your, your basic uh, 
western town. You know, they didn't have paved streets, they didn't have paved sidewalks, they had board sidewalks, but each business was responsible for their own. So there were different levels and steps going between them. Some of them were rotten and some of them were nice. Um, mud was very prevalent. And uh, it, it's not a lifestyle that we really can even imagine now. But that was the common place in the West of the day. Uh, again, you can see in the photo here, uh, the uh, mule tra or the bull trains, those are you know, hauling in supplies for the hills from probably Fort Pier or someplace like that, mostly from Fort Pier. And this photo is supposed to be 1886, so this is a little later. Yes, sir, did the gold rush of uh, 76 have much effect on, on town down here? Not in, not right away. I mean, dirt just didn't exist till 78. Right. But once it did, there was a growing sense of uh, conflict with the rest of Lawrence County. You gotta keep in mind that all of this was Lawrence County. Um, everything on the lower half of Meade County going east was all Lawrence County as well. Butte County had just been segregated off, and that angered a lot of the powers that be in Deadwood because they liked that all the county business came through their town. Uh, at one point, there was even two competing courthouses being built in Deadwood. Um, they, were, they were serious about you know, their county business up there. Um, so there was a, there was a growing um, anxiety between the mining portion of the county and the non-mining portion. We fell into the latter category. So. <laughs> so becoming Scoop Town, and I put some animations in here, and I know Richard loves that because he, he has to put all this into the video at some point. Uh, he doesn't like any the animations. Again, fall of 78, the soldiers were gradually moving to Camp Brulin. Uh, the activity at Scoop Town gradually relocated as well. Main Street was established. Again, we saw that there were a lot of uh, bars and, and dance houses and things already starting in Sturgis. But Scoop Town was a separate location yet at this point. Um, in December 1878, that trans, uh, transition was complete for the most part. Um, you know, all the soldiers, I believe, were at Camp Ruin at that point, and all of the different activities out uh, by Grasshopper Gyms no longer made sense out there. Um, but relocating to Sturgis, it wasn't that Sturgis said, We're now Scoop Town. It was really opportunists that would come in. They'd hear that the uh, payday was coming up for the military, and most of them were Deadwood gamblers and, uh, you know, well, scoundrels for a lot of times. Uh, rounders was a term they used in those days a lot. Uh, but just opportunists that would come down and try to take advantage of the soldiers and their pay that they had just received. Uh, they started Scoop Town in, on Main Street of Sturgis, and, and when they left, Scoop Town would go with them for the most part. That was in the first couple of years. Um, they would respond to announcements of the arrival of the paymaster. The Deadwood Papers would put it in a paper that the paymaster had arrived, and they were the soldiers were getting paid tomorrow, and the stage would fill up with people headed this way. Um, that's not to say nobody in Sturgis was taking advantage of the situation either, but a large amount of the scooping that was going on, the the kind of uh, backroom activities and gambling and those kind of things to take that money was, was being done a lot by outsiders. Um, but paydays were all about the mayhem. It was crazy. And the, the newspapers show it. Uh, shootings, knifings, uh, beatings. There were horses stolen. There were desertions. It was, it was total mayhem. And then things would, would settle down. And, would be good for about a month, and then it was mayhem again. Um, there's even newspaper stories about the original Scoop Town out by Bear Butte, and the, the day after payday, they would talk about, I think it said like there were 120 some men strewn in the fields, passed out, because they just had wandered away from you know all the different uh, drinking halls and stuff, and passed out forever, and that they had to go around and collect these men pick them up and take them back to their, their camp. Uh, there was racing, horse racing by soldiers up and down Main Street. Um, you know, there were some reports that once Sturgis got some 
Uh, lights on the streets, they get shot out regularly by soldiers <laughs> racing up and down the street. Uh, there were fights, knife play, uh, you name it. Uh, murders occurred. We, I, I do a program that's about an hour and a half long, and all it covers is just the murders on Main Street um, from 1878 to 1888, that decade, period. Um, and I, go, I have to go pretty fast to get all of it done. I mean, it was a brutal, brutal place on payday. The rest of the time, it, was, it wasn't too bad. The Main Street still just run the way it runs now? Like, yeah, it's, yeah, the footprint's almost exactly the same. The first map we can find of Main Street is the uh, uh, fire map from 1885. And if you overlay that with a modern map, you, the buildings are almost in the exact same footprint up and down the street because of the, you know, just as a business moves out, they move into another building. Even if the building comes down, they build in the same spot. So it's, it's pretty much exactly how it works. Let's see here. Okay, yeah, there were several shootings between 1878 and 1880. Um, one that comes to mind is, uh, and I, I'm not going to go into all the details of all the shootings and stuff because we'd be here a long time, um, and we're already old. The uh, there was an, a there was a gentleman. Uh, his last name, I believe, was Hanlon, and he had deserted from the Seventh Cavalry. Um, a Lieutenant Starr came into town with a unit. They were looking for him. Their first pass through the Big Bonanza uh, dance hall uh, didn't reveal him. But when they came back, they found him with his best girl, Scarface Charlie. And apparently, he had been hiding under her skirt the first time. They came well, they came in and they got spotted him. And he took off running through the dance hall. And uh, Lieutenant Starr pulled out his pistol to warn him and shot him got him in the kidney or something, I think, and he ended up dying on the street in front of the, on Main Street, in front of the building. That, that building would have been right where the old bank building is, just down the street here now. Um, and it's said that Calamity Jane, who was living in Sturgis at that time, she had soured on Deadwood pretty quickly, um, but she liked being near the military. Um, she came out and brought her bedding from her own room and wrapped him in it and cared for him until he died, which, uh, you know, a lot of people don't associate Calamity Jane with Sturgis, but she was here. Um, that was just one example. There were a lot of shootings and, and things that we don't have time for today. Um, of course, the Deadwood Papers exaggerated that lawlessness. They loved getting under the skin of the people of Sturgis. They loved making Sturgis look as lawless and as horrible as possible. And today, of course, we know the reputation of Deadwood from that era. Um, but they saw themselves as much more civilized and much more uh, a cultural center and all of that. Um, but they did not want Sturgis existing, much less succeeding. Um, and at that time, uh, the Deadwood Enterprise, which was a short-lived paper, referred to Sturgis as the uh, wickedest town in the West. <laughs> and, uh, but that, of course, went through a lot of papers, because everything got passed by paper to paper all over the nation. So all over the nation, Sturgis became the wickedest town in the West, and Deadwood was the one that kept the moniker of Scoop Town going in their newspapers. They were the only real paper in the area that served Sturgis. Of course, Rapid City Journal was there, but they, you know, their treatment of Sturgis was pretty balanced and fair. The Deadwood papers had stories almost every day about some horrible going on in Sturgis. Uh, usually it was somebody from Deadwood that was doing it. But, yeah. um, let's see here. Oh, there was also a building conflict at that time, just a gradual thing building up between the residents of Sturgis and some of the soldier units. Um, also, the soldiers did not get along at all with the, the bullwhackers, the, the um, herdsmen for the, the bull trains and stuff. There was a lot of conflict there, a lot of fights and knife fights and that kind of thing uh, over, over those first few years. And part of it was a lack of control on the 7th Cavalry's part. Um, I kind of correlated when a lot of this bad times were occurring, and they, they were pretty consistent for that whole first decade, but a lot of them occurred when General Sturgis was in command. He left to go be the commander of uh, the old um, soldier's home in Washington, D.C. for a couple of years, and when he came back, things kind of fell apart again. And he left to go do something else, and he'd come back. Well, that was at the same time. Of course, he didn't want to see all the, the dance halls and stuff kicked out of the buildings because he owned the building. 
is a lot of them. Um, so I think there was a, there was a not really uh, purposeful lack of control, but just, you know, turning the blind eye a little bit. Then the arrival of the 25th Infantry in June of 1880 uh, kind of it kind of enhanced a lot of the problems that were going on. Um, while it was a huge financial boon to the town, uh, there quickly were some racial tensions that were exposed in the community. Um, of course, we're not in the South. We don't think of this area having any kind of uh, racial uh, problems, but it, it did, and it, it was very much the culture at that time. Um, you didn't really go anywhere without that race kind of playing into it. Um, the newspapers were particularly savage, the Deadwood Papers. Sturgis didn't have their own paper until 1883. Um, but the Deadwood Papers couldn't comment on anything <coughs> except somebody from the 25th Infantry without commenting that it was unlike their race if it was something good, or like their race if it were was something bad, that kind of thing. They used a lot of derogatory comments and, and <coughs> words. Uh, they also didn't like the Chinese who were populated Deadwood and a lot of Winsturgis Sturges doing laundry and stuff. Uh, they uh, called them Celestials and that kind of thing. Um, talk about getting them out of here and everything. So that, that didn't help the situation. Um, but quickly, when the, the uh, 25th Infantry came to town, they came to Main Street and were welcomed into the vast majority of the businesses. Uh, but there were a couple places that protested happened on there. There was a woman uh, who was bartending at one of the clubs, and she shot one of them in the leg for sitting down at her bar. And uh, so quickly people said, oh, we gotta do something different. And uh, it was actually interest within the 25th Infantry that, that solved a lot of those issues. Um, they sent uh, for their own dance hall girls and everything <coughs> in St. Louis and brought them up. They established a little area between 2nd and 3rd Street on the south side of the street uh, that had more of the clubs that were catering to the 25th Infantry. It wasn't really a segregated area and most of those uh, soldiers could still go into all the businesses and purchase what they wanted and that kind of thing. But they just felt they needed some place that they felt more comfortable. Um, when they were out entertaining themselves. And so they had uh, businesses along that side of the street, but those were also the businesses that were more fun. So most of the 7th Cavalry also hung out in those places, as well as the rounders and stuff that came in for dead. So those, that became the, the uh, kind of the raucous side of town, was that south side of the street between 2nd and 3rd. Um, they, they, uh, they had a club there called um, Abe Hill's Come As You Please Club. And Abe Hill was a former 25th Infantry member, and he had opened this club uh, where, he, you know, and it had the dance hall girls and it had some rooms upstairs and all that kind of stuff. And, and it became kind of this focal point for a lot of um, people's uh, anger directed toward not just the 25th Infantry, but the military in general, as well as just the lifestyle that was occurring on Main Street. So that kind of transitioned us into the Scoop Town years, as I like to say. Um, we had kind of had it placed on our Main Street, but there was a period of time where we became Scoop Town to a large, you know, portion of the, of the area. They saw us as the wild embodiment of the Wild West. A Hills Coming to Police Club, and several others, <coughs> excuse me, several others along that side of the street were, were uh, seen as, as just body houses that you, you stayed away from if you could. Uh, there was increase in violence, prostitution, public drunkenness, um, lots of, of reports of people coming out of the clubs and, and passing out in the middle of the street, people had to carry them out, that kind of thing. Um, it also coincided with a big population boom, Sturgis's big, first big population boom occurred when the Deadwood Fire happened. Um, there were several businesses up there that got burned out. They moved down to Sturgis uh, to rebuild. And then in 1883, there was a huge flood that went through Deadwood. And it's really devastated the community. And a lot of businesses at that point, and residents, picked up and moved to Sturgis. Um, so it started a population boom 
but then that continued because there was a lot of uh, growth at the fort. There was a lot of uh, uh, immigrants coming in for farming in the area, and Sturgis kind of became the center of all that kind of industry and stuff. The county largely ignored the needs. Florence County did. Again, they didn't mind that there was uh, legal problems in Sturgis because all the cases would come up to death. And people would have to come there and testify and you know, uh, be prosecuted if they were you know, accused. And they'd have to stay in a hotel and they'd have to buy meals. And they, they were making a really good industry on it. Uh, which Sturgis, of course, was upset about from day one. The first time they tried to separate themselves, um, the first talk of Sturgis separating itself and the rest of the county to the east from Lawrence County started in December of 1878. And then January of 1879, they already hired somebody to go to the Yankton, to the territorial capital, and ask uh, that a new county be formed of that area. So they, they saw quickly that you know, their needs were not being met in Deadwood, but Deadwood, really couldn't care less. They saw that it was filling their pockets, so they, they thought it was just fine. Well, Push, yeah. That Abe Hills mm -hmm. Come As You Please Club was kind of by Weimers. That yeah, it's either. Side of the street and that. <coughs> I'm thinking it's where that, because in those days they didn't put addresses on anything. They'd say next to this business or across the yeah. street from that business. Yeah. And it just. The only spot I can think of would, is that it would be in that open spot where that building is gone, mm -hmm. between the bank building and Weimers, in that little space. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there were, I mean, that spot was responsible for you know, eight or ten different murders, much less other shootings and fights and night things and stuff. Um, pushback from the local community really started in 1883. Of course, there had been some pushback and some conflict, but uh, Stur just got its own newspaper in the summer of 1883, the Sturgis Record. And they, they were really dedicated to trying to portray the city in a positive light. Because the only things anybody knew were what was in the Deadwood papers. And uh, so they wanted Sturgis to you know, clean up its act so that they could report that. And uh, they also wanted to report that there was a lot of just regular people in Sturgis and a lot of people that uh, weren't part of you know, the whole scoop town uh, activity. So the Sturgis record uh, was one of the things that really got people thinking about improving the image and improving uh, lifestyle in town, that sort of thing. And in 1880, summer of 1883, we also got a new deputy sheriff, WFL Suter, came to town. And he was kind of our own uh, James Arness, you know? <laughs> he kind of came in. He was our uh, uh, Hickok, not Hickok. Um, What's that? Bullock. Bullock. Thank you, Bullock. He was kind of our own Bullock. He came in and he was he, he was a no-nonsense kind of lawman. And uh, bigger fella, uh, he ended up down the road becoming the first fire marshal. Then he became the first chief of police for the city. Then he became the first sheriff of Meade County. Um, he, he, was, he was a pretty remarkable guy. During that time, there were also two vigilante hangings. And that did a lot to kind of show that Sturgis was, you know, it was a bad thing, but it showed that Sturgis was really trying to clean up its act. But it also then uh, upset a lot of people. In 1884, there was a hanging of a guy named um, Alex Fiddler, who, along with two members of the 7th Cavalry, had beaten and robbed a man just outside of Fort Lee, on this side of Fort Lee, about where the soccer fields are. Um, and he, uh, he ended up surviving, but they knew who did it. They figured it out because one of the soldiers got shot in the arm, and uh, they they got him to talk, and he gave up Alex Fiddler, uh, who had, was a, had been in trouble here before and had been to the penitentiary in Detroit. At that time, Dakota Territory was still sending all their pen, their, uh, crip, their uh, convicts to Detroit. 1883 is when the penitentiary in Sioux Falls opened. Um, but Alex Fiddler uh, was taken to the jail here in town, and later that night, about a dozen local men with masks on their faces came up, knocked on the door, and were let into the jail, and they took him away, and strung him up on a tree on the west edge of town, um, 
we were just talking about Fiddler Street and where it was, because it became known as Fiddler Street. And a lot of communities then referred to hanging trees as Fiddler's trees after that. Mm -hmm. um, but Alex Fiddler was, was lynched. Um, the tree isn't there anymore. It was a tourist attraction for a long time. <laughs> Um, but when Main Street used to go down and then turn underneath the railroad bridge and then go up over the hill toward Deadwood, mm -hmm. it was right after you go under the bridge and as you're just turning the corner there again. It was then cut down to build the old house that's there. That was a uh, nursing hospital. Um, and it was cut down for that. So uh, that was 1884. And then in 1885, there was another uh, lynching that occurred from the same, probably the same vigilant uh, committee. They, uh, uh, Corporal Hallen, Ross Hallen from the 25th Infantry had killed a doctor in town, uh, allegedly had killed a doctor in town, um, and he was taken out of the jail and he was also hung from the same branch. So you've got to imagine it was probably the same people that did it. Um, but again, it, it caused two different effects. On one hand, a lot of local people applauded it. They thought it was a sign that um, Scoop Town was changing its ways, uh, but most of the people at Fort Meade did not applaud that, but particularly the 25th Infantry. And uh, later that fall, after a fight at um, Abe Hill's Coming to Please Club, a couple of them got thrown out um, by Abe Hill, who was a former member of the 25th, and they went back, gathered up, and numbers are really speculative, but anywhere from 15 to 25 members of that unit uh, armed themselves and marched in military formation into town and shot up Main Street. Uh, most of their anger was focused on Abe Hill's club, and a, a cowboy that was sitting in the window uh, playing the guitar was killed. Um, but they shot up a couple other buildings and then quickly marched off because the 7th Cavalry was on its way to collect them. And so they went up over the hill and got back to Fort Meade. Some of them were charged, but uh, nothing really ever came of that. And it, that's when this community asked uh, for the 25th Infantry to be removed. General Terry turned around and said, I'm not doing it. Uh, you guys have brought this on yourselves by having this kind of atmosphere, allowing it in your community, allowing your main street to be used as a, a scene of debauchery. So I'm not moving. Um, it, it, it caused a lot of conflict, and the city fathers finally said, you know what, we need to be able to, to have control over our own destiny. Uh, we can't count on the county to do it. Uh, so they incorporated the community. Um, that was early 1886. Um, they incorporated it as a village, I believe. And then the law changed in 1888, and they became a city. And they dropped Sturgis, the city off Sturgis City at that point. So that's why there's so many different dates to the founding of Sturgis. You'll see them on different buildings downtown. I've seen 1876, 78, 88, all kinds of stuff. Uh, but there's, there's been multiple foundings of the town. Um, oh, they also renewed their push to sever from the county. They had never really given it up, but now they, they got serious about it. Uh, Dad would continue to, uh, to influence financially a lot of the people in the legislature. Uh, which was now located in Bismarck, and uh, Sturgis struggled, but eventually they did get um, named as Meade County in 1887. Um, however, the governor at the time didn't enforce it, and the people of Lawrence County, the county commissioners and stuff, ignored the fact that it was in its own county. So it wasn't really until 1889 when the statehood was occurring that that uh, Mead County came into its own. Well, Mark, when was the presence of the uh, Ku Klux Klan? That was in the 1920s. Much later. Much later, yes. Uh, that, there were also limits placed on the disreputable businesses. You know, the, the come as you go club and those kind of things. Uh, if they weren't allowed, if there were complaints filed against them, those were counted as demerits uh, toward that business and they were closed if they. Uh, had too many of them. Uh, by incorporating, now they could issue liquor licenses, uh, which helped control a lot of that. Um, of course, the county would turn around, and uh, Lawrence County would turn around and issue liquor licenses right back to them. And they'd set up just outside the city limits, across Fairview Creek, 
or in the no man's land between here and Fort Meade. Uh, so the Lawrence County just kind of gave them a new license and they moved a little bit and kept up their activity. Everything really didn't come to a, a halt. It didn't never came to a halt, per se, but uh, the worst of it didn't really stop until we actually had the removal of the 7th Cavalry and the 25th Infantry, 1887. Six. Eight. 1888. 1888. Okay. And that's when the, I guess, just bad habits that they had and their, their uh, relationship with the community uh, just couldn't, wasn't going to get better. And they were removed, and a new infantry unit, and the cavalry came in, and they, they uh, had a whole different approach. There were still conflicts, there were still you know, shootings occasionally, and that sort of thing, but it wasn't anything compared to that first decade of, of the town's history. Now that's looking at it from you know the conflict part. There was also a lot of harmony going on. Uh, we had um, a strong partnership between the community and the fort. Uh, the fort would do a lot of their uh, uh, dress parades and stuff out there. They do their evening concerts, and they said that the line of carriages coming from Sturgis out there uh, was just nonstop those nights uh, during the summer months and stuff because people would go out there and they'd go all the way around the parade grounds with their carriages and listen to the music, watch the, the Black Horse Troop um, perform uh, with the 7th Cavalry, that sort of thing. And of course, that even got more advanced than when the 8th Infantry came in because they had a stronger band presence out there. Um, they, they worked on a lot of the, or rode in a lot of the parades and stuff in town. Um, they had a lot of sporting events. They had their own baseball team out there, and Sturgis had their own. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's where the name Scooper comes from. It is from the baseball team of 1896. They were really, really good. And they were Eating Deadwood and everybody, and so the Rapid City Journal suggested if the uh, if the players from Scoop Town are planning to scoop all the teams in the hills, they should just call themselves Scoopers. That's where the name came from. Rapid City Journal. Uh, and then there are a lot of fraternal and military organizations. Fort Meade and Sturgis kind of had their own, but they worked a lot together. They worked together to have a big GAR, um, Grand Army of the Republic reunion here one year and that sort of thing. And it was a great relationship between the two things. There was just that conflict over that downtown area all the time. And here's a picture of a, a cavalry unit coming down to the student parade, probably 4th of July or something. And then eventually they became family. You know, a lot of the soldiers came here, met local girl, stayed or took local girl and went on to the next military post. Uh, this gentleman is my grandfather, he was bugler here, came from Kansas in 1928, uh, met a local girl and stayed. Uh, and you can see his military pants there on the other side. He has, still has on his military pants and boots with a civilian jacket and stuff. But, you know, that's, that was kind of the ongoing legacy. A lot of families here can, can trace their, that in their history. You know, that somebody came to serve in our cavalry here. Uh, he was a bugler with the headquarters from 1928 to 1931, and, uh, and just didn't leave. So here we are. Um, so it, it, it's, it's a legacy that, that turned out as a very positive thing. It, it had some rough spots in there, though. So and I think that's all I have. Do we have any questions for oh. any of us? I know I went wrong. I, my apologies, folks. Thank you for all of you. Thank you. Thank you.